Well, good morning, everybody. Like my darling wife said, that is my lovely wife. Why don't you give the first lady a hand this morning? Like my lovely wife said, my name is Gino Allison. I'm one of the pastors here, and I want to welcome you all to the South Suburban Vineyard Church. Special welcome to those of you who might be visiting here for the first time, or maybe you're here for the first time in a long time. It doesn't make a difference. We're glad that you're here, and I want to say hello to our regulars alike. We're also glad to see you here today. And we cannot forget about our online audience. So glad to have you here worshiping with us virtually. And if you could make it here in person, that would be even better. Well, I want to just say uh, a couple things before I get into the the message this morning. Uh, That last week was Easter uh, Sunday, uh, Easter weekend. And uh, so many of you worked really, really hard to invite your friends and your family. And even though we had a whole lot of people out last week because on Easter, folks go visit their families, churches, and things like that, we made history last week. So in our fourth, yeah. <laughs> you want to hear what it is first, right? In our, in our almost 14 years of being here, we've never crossed the 200 barrier in attendance. And for the first time, with loads of people missing, We hit over 200 people last week, and so that's a reason to celebrate, right? If you know anything about church planting, you know that that is a major milestone uh, in the life of a church, and we have just been doing uh, things strategically to stay ahead of the rapid growth that we're experiencing. I'm thankful for our leaders. We've even set up a loft area up there for our leaders as overflow. And so I'm super grateful for what God is doing in this community. I, my sense is that we've, this is only the beginning. And so I lovingly tell you to hang on because my sense is that it's going to be a wild ride. And so I'm thankful for all that God is doing. I also want to mention briefly that we have a position opening. We are hiring. We're looking for a new student ministry coordinator. Now, the student ministry coordinator leads pastors and shepherds and coordinates the student ministry, which is our middle schoolers and high schoolers. So we're looking for a spirit-filled, energetic person to help take that ministry uh, uh, on this next leg of the journey. And so if you are qualified, if you can pass a background check, <laughs> you love the Lord, and you love students, because that's important too, uh, feel free to come talk to me or email us at info at southsuburbanvineyard.org. We're going to be sending out some information this uh, morning. I'm told there are job descriptions on the back information table. And so if the spirit quickened you in that moment when I said student ministry coordinator, uh, come talk to me. We'd love to uh, begin that conversation. Well, let me get to the word uh, this morning. Uh, I'm in the season of my life and ministry where I have this, you know, this growing desire to see more lost people come to Jesus. When I say lost people, I mean people who don't know who Jesus is, or maybe people who've forgotten. Maybe folks who the circumstances and the people in their life have conspired against them to put loads and loads of space between them and saving faith. More people to come to know Jesus. Now, that's a major part of why we moved here 13, almost 14 years ago to start this church. It's central to what we do as a Christian church, but it's also true that much of vocational ministry can be spent tending to the souls of folks who are already convinced. Now, I don't say that to belittle that aspect. That's a significant part of what we do, but in this particular season of life, I'm convinced now more than ever that God desires that we be more intentional about reaching the laws. As we've seen these numbers climb and as we've uh, uh, initiated things like Alpha, which is our Christian basics class, and see people wrestling with the basics of Christian faith, I want to spend more time and energy these days focusing on the mercy of God, which is the oil of the kingdom of heaven, forgiveness of sin through the person and work of Christ. I want to explore the role and work of the Holy Spirit in bringing us to saving faith and helping us live the abundant life, which, by the way, next week we're going to start a brand new teaching series called Empowered, and we're going to spend about six or seven weeks talking about the person and the the role and work of the Holy Spirit, and so you don't want to miss that. But I want to lean heavily on God's heart for those who are lost and wayward, and I want to spend some time this morning, we almost exclusively teach in series around here, But on the heels of Easter weekend, where we talked about wrestling with doubt and pressing toward Jesus, I want to do a one-off message this morning 
on God's heart for those who are lost and those who are wayward, those who are lost and those who have wandered from Jesus. I want to talk about this for at least three reasons. The first is we need to be regularly reminded about God's disposition toward those who are lost. I'll say that again. We need to be regularly reminded, even those of us who are found, we need to be regularly reminded about God's heart and his disposition toward those who are lost. Secondly, these constant reminders should inform our disposition toward those who are lost. And third, if you are far from God today, if you are wayward, if you are wondering, if you are wanting to draw close, contemplating a return to Jesus, you need to hear regularly of God's disposition toward you. You need to hear what God thinks of you. And here's how I know this. I regularly talk to people who go, listen, Pastor, you keep inviting me to church. But look, if I come to church, the place is going to fall down. Lightning might strike it. And I have to remind them often that, look, I know the intimate details of a lot of people that come here. And if the place is still standing and they're here, <laughs> and I'm not looking at anybody in particular, Shannon, uh, you can come too. They need to regularly hear that you haven't gone so far as to where you can't come back. Or your, your, your sin, how arrogant is it that your sin, your, your stuff is too big for the blood to cover. It's just not true. And so we regularly need to talk about these things so that we might be reminded of God's heart and his disposition. So it might inform our disposition toward those who are lost. And so the lost can hear and know that they are welcome in God's house. And so I'm simply calling this message this morning, Lost and Found. Lost and Found. I'm going to be this morning in a familiar passage of Scripture, Luke chapter 15, starting at verse 11. And it is the famous story of the lost son. Some would recognize the story as the prodigal son. And I know that in a room this size, many of you have grown up in church or been to Sunday school or interact with various devotions or scriptures, and this would not be a new story to you, and some of you it would be. But I issue the regular charge that I issue whenever we engage a familiar text is don't get too comfortable in your seat. Don't think that you've heard everything there is to hear about a given passage or a given text. We are interacting with the living word. And in the living word, there are things, even in the same passages and texts, that you haven't wrestled with yet. So lean forward today as God has something to teach us. Luke chapter 15, meet me there in your Bibles today. Uh, there are Bibles on the edges of your rows. Feel free to interact with those paper Bibles. You can also interact with the scriptures on your tablets or your phones. We'll also be projecting the screens, uh, the, the text on the screens. While you find that, Luke 15, let me pray for us this morning. Father in heaven, we thank you for yet another opportunity to come and to worship. Yet another opportunity to put our legs underneath your table and feast on whatever you put there. And so, Father, I pray that you would put power in the words that you've given me to speak. I pray that the word would be effective today. I pray that it would do kingdom work. I pray that this would be helpful reminders for some, news to others, but no matter how it lands, on whomever it lands, Lord, may it move us one step closer to you today than we were when we came in the door. Come Holy Spirit, do what only you can do in the strong name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Luke chapter 15. Let me set this up. Luke opens, Luke 15 opens, to Jesus having more problems with the Pharisees, the teachers of religious law, basically church folks. We're the only folks that gave Jesus problems with church folks. Isn't that interesting? Uh, <laughs> so in the beginning of this chapter, we see exactly what their problem was with Jesus. Verse 1 says, tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. This made the Pharisees and teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people, even eating with them. And I imagine Jesus, as he entertains these petty little things yet again, he goes, here we go again. Jesus and his haters are at it yet 
again. But Jesus being Jesus, Jesus being the master teacher, he implores the use of parables to get his point across. Now, a parable isn't just a story, because if you tell a story to make your point, you're at the mercy of the details of that story in order to make your point. Parables are made-up stories that are tailor-made for the point that you're trying to make. And so Jesus often told parables or these stories that he made up to illustrate really, really important points. And so in response to their pushback for him hanging out with sinners, Jesus tells a series of three parables. The first is the parable of the lost sheep. A fellow has a hundred sheep, one gets lost. Jesus poses the question, won't he leave the 99 others, just like we sang in the beautiful song we just sung? And carry it, leave the 99 others to go and find that one that was lost. And in finding that one that was lost, carry it back on his shoulders, gather his buddies together and celebrate because he found the lost sheep. He says in verse 7, in the same way, there's more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. Jesus puts in another quick parable to help them understand why he seeks after and hangs out with those who are lost. He tells the parable of the lost coin. A woman has 10 silver coins. She loses one. He says, won't she light a lamp? tear up the whole house until she finds it. Not only that, when she finds it, she's going to call her friends together and they're going to throw a party and celebrate because she's found her lost coin. And considering Jesus' audience, pious, important, perhaps even wealthy men, maybe Jesus thought, maybe these guys are too, a little too white-collar to understand the whole sheep story. Uh, perhaps these guys are... Uh, maybe too well off to understand the value of one lost coin. Perhaps Jesus thought these guys need a more relevant illustration. Maybe they best understand the loss of a person, somebody important to them. First century Jewish culture, sons were really, really important. They were a man's pride and joy. And as quiet as it is kept, they were that man's retirement <laughs> program as well because your kids took care of you, right? And so to lose a son would particularly resonate with this particular audience. And so Jesus chooses to tell just one more parable in the series. And this is the parable of the lost son. Verse 11 says, to illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. And so his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, his younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land, and there he wasted all his money on wild living. Somebody say wild living. Wild living. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land, and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. Verse 20, so he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father said to the servants, quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and, uh, and sandals for his feet. And kill the calf we have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast, for this son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. For he was lost, but now is found. So the party began. Fascinating text. One of my favorites. The parable of the lost son. In case you haven't put it together already, this parable is symbolic. These characters in this story don't necessarily represent themselves, but they represent others in the story. This father here represents God, our father. 
And the sons in this story, we don't talk about the older son. And if you read this whole story, I'm assigning it, by the way, for homework. That's an interesting storyline. But the, but, the, but, but the sons in this particular parable represent us, humanity. And in this text, we get a mini intensive on our human lean towards sin and our propensity to center ourselves in our own lives. But we also get an intensive on repentance, an intensive on the Father's heart, an intensive on forgiveness. It's all here if you have eyes to see it. And so this story opens with a shocking moment, and we should make no mistake that this is a defining moment. As we often encounter when we come into these texts like this, I often say that this is a defining moment. And you might say, well, this is a defining moment for who, Pastor? This is a defining moment for everybody in this story. There are certain events that unfold in life that test certain people. But there are certain defining moments like this that touch everybody, that show you what everybody is made of. And this act, this question that this young man poses to his father will test everybody in the story, it's a measuring moment. It's going to test the father and his love and his wisdom. It's going to test the younger son who foolishly makes the audacious request. And if you read the story further, it's going to test the older brother as well. Everybody gets touched. This is, after all, a defining moment. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. Imagine that. And I'm trying to wrap my mind around one of my knucklehead sons coming to me, <laughs> fixing their lips to ask me for their inheritance. One, it's not going to be that much. <laughs> you might get a Greyhound ticket to Birmingham, Alabama. You might be able to get you a few sandwiches, but you might want to let this thing mature a little longer. But I'm trying to wrap my mind around this. No matter what tone of voice you use to ask this question, it's out of line. And this kid isn't going to his dad to ask for a little folding money to go to the movies and to get a snack. He's saying essentially, Dad, you are taking too long to die. I need to cash out real quick. Shocking and audacious. It's dripping with irreverence. It's disrespectful. It's a slap in his father's face. Now, this is shocking to our 21st century sensibilities, but imagine how this would sound to a first century audience. Men, of filial respect and filial etiquette is of the utmost importance. No good son would ever be so bold as to make such a request. And yet he does. And this is, for everybody, a measuring moment. And at least three things jump out as I walk through this text, and I want to highlight them as we talk about being lost and then found. The first is the father lets him go. I like these texts like this, familiar text, common stories, because things jump out at me that didn't jump out before. If you take the flashlight and you just hit it from a different angle, you see things that you saw, but you didn't see it. You knew, but you didn't know them. And this hopped out at me this week. The son makes this audacious request, but surprisingly, the father lets him grow, go. He grants his request. Now, I wanted to be clear to us that the father, he doesn't have to sign off on this. He doesn't have to permit him to leave. And minimally, he shouldn't resource his son's folly by cashing him out early. Minimally. And yet, he lets him go. Maybe this isn't so shocking, particularly when we consider who these characters represent. The father in the story is our heavenly father. The son here is us. 
a sinful humanity. And the truth is, whether you like it or not, whether you want to hear it or not, God will almost always let us go if we want to go. God will almost always let us go if we want to go. Let that sink in for a second. I love Paul's words in Romans chapter 1, verse 23 through 25. He says, and instead of worshiping the glorious ever-living God, they worship idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. So God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired, and as a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. They traded the truth about God for a lie, so they worshiped and served the things God created instead of the creator himself, who is worthy of eternal praise. Paul says, God's wrath toward these sinful people was not lashing them with whips and throwing bolts of punishment toward them. He simply did what? He gave them over to the stuff that they wanted. He said, fine. You want to go, go. You want to have it, have it. You want to do it, do it. And oftentimes, this is what God does to us. He lets us have what we, what we want so badly. And if you pay close attention to this young man's story, it's not hard to identify where he went wrong. He played a starring role in, his, in screwing up his own life. And I'm glad we got our students in here today because if you get this message earlier in life, you'll be better off. He plays a starring role in royally messing up his whole life. That is to say there's a certain path he took. There's a series of decisions that paved the road to his failure and demise. He was too smart for his own good. He had that classic teenage, 20-something, 30-something arrogance, and nobody could tell him anything. I know none of you know what it means to know everything, to be too smart for your own good, but my man right here, he knew everything. He had it planned out. This was some of his best Life engineering, this was some of his best thinking that ran him right over the cliff. He left prematurely, he made sudden moves, he, he made avoidable mistakes, and the outcome was fairly predictable. Verse 13, a few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings, moved to a distant land, he went far away, and there he wasted all his money on what? Wild living wild living. Anybody had a taste of that? <laughs> wild living? I know some of y'all are real saved and sanctified, but there's at least one or two people in here that know what it means to waste your life and resource on wild living. Some of y'all were living wild just last night. wild living and he blows through his inheritance and you can use your imagination as to how we don't get the sense that he he invested his money and just the investment went south or he was strategic and wise about where he put his money only the market crashed and through some bad luck he lost all of his money no 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 he spent his money on wild living pocket full of money which attracts a whole lot of good time buddies. And he, as the kids say, he turned all the way up with this money. He's in the club, he's making it, you know, it rain everywhere, wasted it, blew through it, wild living. And as my late father used to say, he said, son, money can't say a word, but it will soon tell a fool goodbye. <laughs> now, <laughs> That's the Reverend Gene Ollison right there. You can thank him for that. And it's easy to look at this young man and go, what moron? And you wouldn't be wrong. But, but you need to remember that he is us. And we've all played a starring role 
and screwing up our own lives. And if you haven't yet, you need to know that you have the potential to. We all have the propensity. We all have it in us. The prophet Isaiah says in Isaiah 53, verse 6, all of us, like sheep, have what? Strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our, our own. Paul says in Romans 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We all have this in us. And some of us are fresh off experiences where we have messed things up. And so we shouldn't be surprised. The lost son is doing precisely what humans do. They get themselves lost. He's doing precisely what humans do is they go wandering off in search of greener grass. Luckily, God is doing what he does. Among other things, he gives us the choice, which can seem cruel at the time, but it's got a plan. He's working something out. So the second thing I see here is the son decides to go off, the father lets him, and then the consequences come to bear on his life. The consequences come to bear on this life. Now, the students, this is where you get to the edge of your seat and you listen real intently because the scripture tells us that what we sow, we will reap. Don't matter what you put in the ground, more of what you put in the ground is going to come out the ground. The consequences of his actions and decisions will come to bear on his life. Verse 14, about the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land, and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into his field to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. How hungry you got to get for the pig food? He didn't say the pig, because some of us, we love the swine. <laughs> he didn't say the pig. We're not talking about bacon and, you know, hocks and all that stuff. We're talking about the pig food begin to look appetizing, which demonstrates the depths to which he has sank. And before we feel bad for this young man, we must know that this is part of the outworking of God's mercy. That sometimes God's faithfulness and his pursuing love is that he lets the consequences of your actions come to bear on your life. Because people can warn you a million times about something. Some of us will never get it until we live it. Ask any parent. <laughs> Ask any grandparent. Beg them, no, look, don't spend your money on that. Look, 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 that person isn't right for you. Ask any pastor if this is true or not. Ask any discipler, any mentor, any teacher. We would love for people to learn from our mistakes. To hear us say, look, I just fell in that open manhole. Look, don't fall in there too. And nine of the ten people that you tell that will do what? They'll fall right in the hole. Some of us will get it because we observe somebody else not getting it. But most of us have to live it. This is why Paul's words in Romans chapter 1 rings true. God gave them over. We were itching to do something. We, we had to have that man or woman. You blew through all of the red flags, all of the flashing lights, and you were certain that though a million other people were ensnared by their folly, you would be the slick one that would find a way around God's universal principle that you will reap what you sow. 
that you will be the slick one, that you somehow will harvest something better than what you put in the ground. Consequences came crashing down on this young brother. And the father says, go ahead, have at it. And his money ran out, ran out. his good time buddies ran out. To get a low paying job, and he's starving to the point that even the pig food looks good. This is lower than low. But I'm glad it doesn't end here. And I think it's helpful, maybe even necessary, to pause here. You ever, you're ever at the mall or Jason Whale or Six Flags, and you go up to the map and it says, You are here. My guess is that in a room this size, some of you would locate yourself at this particular moment in your particular story. You have gone your own way. And the consequences of your actions have been brought to bear on your life. This is like where you are. Or this is where you're headed. But how many of you are glad I got a third point to this sermon. And the third point is repentance and forgiveness happens. Yeah, we preach good news at this church. We're going to tell you straight, but this is a good news church. And so we encounter another defining moment with this young man and his father get to show us again what they're made of. Verse 17, when he finally came to his senses, I think the King James Version said, when he came to himself, he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. He said, I'm a mess. This don't make no sense. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you. I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. Now, my question is, he left real wrong. How did he know that this would even work? He, he seems contrite, but he, he seems also certain that if he goes home and if he says this the right way and if he's contrite, he, he seems to know that his father will take him back. He was wrong. He was out of line to say he burned the bridge is an understatement. How did he know? And I bet his father had let him know his whole life. In word, in deed, in disposition, that, boy, there's nothing you can do that you won't be my boy. I bet he told him all the time, you can always come home. If you steal the money, you can come home. If you do 15 to life, you can come home. If you start to doubt the tenets of our faith that we hold dear, you can come home. I was interacting with this text years ago, and my sons were much younger, and so I just wanted to test them. I said, I asked them, I said, what, what do you think you can do to make me and your mother stop loving you? Now, what a father hopes is that he's done his job right, and the kids will just laugh him out of the room. Don't be ridiculous. Really? Come on, man. What are we talking about here? But they didn't say that. Their faces grew serious. Their eyes do that thing that they do when they start looking up and searching their mind for an answer. And one after the other, they, they, they thought of just some despicable thing that they could do. Like, like if I killed somebody? If I hurt you? Or my, like, and they just went through the thing. And, and, and I tell you, a little bit of my heart broke because they didn't know that there was nothing that they could do to ever disearn my love. 
And so in preparation for the day, I just I asked one of them real quick, and I said, hey, and I got the answer that I was looking for, which means that I'm telling them the right stuff. He somehow knew that he could always, that he could always come home because his father had offered him and made available to him that, that reckless love that we sang about earlier, that reckless love that grants, in a sense, a pre-forgiveness. It grants a pre-forgiveness that anticipates mistakes. It budgets for failure and the absolute unimaginable to happen. It pre-forgives. And it conditions the relationship to say, no matter how far you've left, you can turn around and make those same steps to come back. And so the son comes to his senses, and he hatches a plan. And after hatching a plan, he gets up. I love this language. He gets up. There's some, something physical, actionable, active about getting up from where you are, and moving in the direction that you need to go, moving in the direction toward home. There's something physical about getting up, spiritual, mental, emotional, about getting your butt up. Because as hopeful uh, as it is that you can always come home, you have to understand that the same distance that you have walked away, you've got to make that same trip back. My man went to the far country, so he had, a, he had a ways to go. But I love that as the sun gets up physically, spiritually, emotionally, mentally, the father also got up. Now, how do we know that the father got up? Verse 20 says, so he returned home to his father, finally made his way home, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Now, how'd the father see him coming if he was sitting in the easy chair? Don't tell us how long the boy was gone, but we knew he went far away, and so even if it was a short time away, he still had to come back, and so something tells me that this was a regular thing for the father. The wife said, you going out to get the mail again? I'm going to go check out and check on the flowers and get the mail out of the mailbox, and yet he, he's looking. He sees something in the distance, gets excited. Oh, that's just, that's just Jeb from down the street. Not today. He goes out again and again and again and again. And on that day where his son is returning, because he got up to go check, he looks. He looks again closer. And how many of you know, like your kids, you can see them from far off. It's the shape of that head. <laughs> you know, it's a slow bob. It's the gate with which they walk. When you look and you can see, and the father was looking. He got up too. He said, two to be reconciled. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son embraced him, and kissed him. Look at this picture. In the ancient world, men, especially wealthy men, did not run. It was undignified. It was beneath them. And you certainly wouldn't run toward your snotty son, bratty little son that has embarrassed you in front of your community. You would not do that because you've got values. You've got standards. But in God's economy, forgiveness and reconciliation is an overriding value which means it's more important than anything else, especially when the young man humbles himself to come home. He runs toward him, embraces him, kisses him, and the son goes, yeah, I got a, I got a speech. He gets his speech out. Father, I have sinned against heaven and you, and I'm no worthy of being your son. The father stops him right there. 
He repents. Notice what he says, but notice what he doesn't say. Hey, Dad, if you were hurt by what I said, you know, uh, my bad. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry you took it that way. What did he say? I have sinned against heaven. And I have sinned against you, my father. And look, if you look at the earlier draft of his speech, you'll notice that when he got home, his father didn't even let him finish it. That's all I need to hear, my boy. Y'all go get a ring for my man. Let's cook that meat we've been saving. My boy's home. Now, why, why, why am I taking the time to meander through this story? Because God cares about the lost. Now, what started this whole series of stories is somebody asked Jesus a question. Jesus didn't like their tone, but he had to speak to it for their sake and for ours because we'd be reading it thousands of years later, and he needed to drill down his disposition toward those who, have law, who are lost. Why am I hanging out with sinners? Because I'm what they need. Why am I hanging out with people who are spiritually sick? Because I'm the great physician. Where else are they going to go? Who else is going to tend to them? Not to mention, I'm trying to set an example for the disciples and the disciples of the disciples and the disciples of the disciples of the disciples so they can get my heart for the lost. So that they would never ever forget that this is what it's all about. You can shut these lights off. You can raise this stage. You could take away the singers and all the stuff and what would be left? Where are the lost people at? What are hurting and broken? That's why we do all this. That's why we sing and pray and preach. Of course we want to perfect the saints, but there are people who are dying and going to hell. And Jesus would say to us, don't you ever forget why you've been commissioned. Don't you ever forget what this is all about. And for those of you who are lost in worship team, you can come up as I land this plane. For those of you who are lost, don't you ever, don't you ever forget that no matter what you've done, no matter how far you've strayed, that you can always come home. Now I'm talking to at least two categories of lost people when I say this. I'm talking about those of you who have never surrendered your life to Jesus. You've never surrendered your life to Jesus. Now, the fact that you're even listening to me means that there's at least some curiosity. But I talk to enough lost people to say with certainty that they don't always know that Jesus would have them. They don't always know that they are welcome at his table. And if you hear and you hadn't heard, or if you're here and you heard it and you didn't believe it, may I say it plainly and without equivocation, you know, Jesus wants you. He's searching for you. He's drawing you. He's inviting you. He's pursuing you. He's looking for you. Others of you used to have a connection to Jesus. You used to have a connection to saving faith and something happened. Someone happened. Something happened to drive a wedge between you. You used to be hot and heavy. You used to be here every time the doors open. There used to be a white, hat, a white hot passion for the things of God, and then something happened. Maybe it was the COVID shutdown that robbed you of that discipline and rhythm of engaging regularly. Maybe you drifted. Maybe you start seeing somebody, and they weren't quite engaged, and they weren't quite excited about Jesus, and something or someone pulled you away, and you are in the far country. Would you hear me when I say to you today that you could always come home? 
You know, you got to do an honest inventory about this stuff. We don't do any arm twisting here for salvation. We don't demand that you come down to the altar. We don't hold up and hijack the service until we get, you know, five or six. We make the invitation because the same spirit that prompts us to make this invitation is the same spirit that is working within you even now, drawing you close. Who's lost today? Who's wayward and wondering? Now, every single week, we make an invitation for people to receive Christ. And usually it works this way. The prayer ministry team after the service are over there. If you want to receive Christ, you can go and pray the prayer with them or you can connect with them. But today, I want to do something a little bit different. No pressure, no manipulation. But after we sing this one song, I'm going to ask if there's somebody in here today that wants to come down and receive Jesus. Maybe you've never made a commitment to follow him. Or maybe you've drifted, and in your heart you've drifted. And some of you have drifted, and nobody would be able to tell it. But in the recesses of your heart, you know that you are not walking with Jesus. You know that you are engaged in your version of wild living in the far country. And so after this song we sing, I am going to make a personal invitation for you to physically move from your seat and come down. Nobody's going to force you. Nobody's going to embarrass you. But you will have that opportunity. Here's what else I'm going to say. If that frightens you a bit, there's somebody near you that will walk with you. And so I'm going to ask everybody to just do a buddy check today. Whether you know the person or not, and say, hey, you good? <laughs> so I'll walk down with you. I'm not going to do this every week unless the Lord tells me to do it every week, but he told me to do it today. And if nobody comes, you know what? Jesus is still on the throne. But you will get an opportunity, and you're going to get about five or six minutes to make the decision. Why don't you stand with me as I pray? God, I thank you that the lost don't have to stay lost. That you've created a home, you've created a place for us where we can draw close. And you're doing something in the room, you're doing something for those watching the stream. And I pray, Father, that we would listen and respond to what you say the lost will come home today. That those who are wayward and wandering will make their way back. And that today would be the first day of the rest of their life. Come Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen.